we're now going to move on to the next um, portion, which is which is where we're joined again by uh, the plenary speakers from throughout the day for a group Q&A section. Um, can I again ask you to put your questions in the live Q&A section on the right hand side of your screen? And if you wish uh, your question to be directed to a specific individual, could you please put that person's name in the question? Um, so we're, we're joined again, um, and I'm not sure whether anyone uh, wishes to make any comments uh, before we start, but we, we've got quite a few of the, the presenters. We've got uh, Eva Lloyd back, we've got John McKendrick, we've got Johanna, and I'm a, I apologise, I cannot say your second name, I do apologise, and we've also got Paul back as well. So, uh, and, um, so I think I think we can we can sort of kick off with how does everyone feel um, in terms of the, the day has gone? I think one of the things that has been very obvious to me listening to a lot of the talks is the fact that there's commonality that's been mentioned across lots and lots of um, people uh, uh, in terms of their presentations, very specifically around the fact that no child is a poor child, uh, said in very different ways, but we should always start off with the idea that every child has the potential and how do we make sure that we give them the ability to, um, that, that we give them the ability to achieve their full potential. Um, I suppose I, I'd like to, to kick off with the one issue that's come up in that one of the, in most of the sessions actually, that the, the factors that seem to affect life chances in some ways more than anything else is often the impact of a child's capacity for self-control or self-regulation that is often learned in early years that has a long-term impact over time. I'm not sure whether any of the speakers would like to comment a little bit more on that. Uh, and can I remind you to sort of um, unmute yourselves if you if you wish to speak. We've got total silence, so that's very good. <laughs> OK, uh, I mean, I, I suppose for me, um, it, I, I managed to get into a little bit of uh, Alan Sinclair's workshop this afternoon and, and the data um, from the Dunedin study, which has indicated that a significant impact of early years on um, the long term life chances of, of the cohort that they've continued to study up to the age of, I think it's 35 at the moment, has had very significant views in terms of the development of early years having implications for life chances and life, uh, life um, choices as well across the piece. So I think it would be very, it would be very beneficial if anybody's got any further information on that. I mean, I can maybe say something about that, Janet, and that's, you know, uh, on, on growing up in Scotland, which by no means is quite at the stage of Dunedin, um, we have got similarly indicative findings. We have been measuring uh, aspects of children's lives from, from birth. Uh, certainly the first time we spoke to our families, the children were only aged 10 months, and and they're now 17 um, and we've been doing some analysis looking at those very early experiences up to about age 12. Um, our age 14 data has just been released and we'll continue to look over that period and we do find lots of associations between what goes on in that very early period uh, and uh, how children are doing uh, much later in life, not quite as late as Dunedin. Uh, but I think what we can see from lots of studies like Gus and Dunedin, um, and lots of these are UK uh, studies as well, or birth cohorts, is that, that, that that's an incredibly uh, important period. And I guess what is a little bit surprising, given how strong the evidence is on the importance of that period, uh, why we haven't quite nailed it in terms of what we're doing to support children and families um, and I think what we talked about similarly in Alan's session and I'm not sure if you were in that session but uh, you know I've been 
talking about early years in Scotland for for about 15 years now, um, since more or less we launched the Grown Up in Scotland study, and it was launched to provide um, a data, a rich data resource on that early period to understand better what could be done, uh, what factors influence children's outcomes, what services and policies and interventions could be done to improve those outcomes, improve lives for children and families. Um, uh, but but we've sort of come around in a circular fashion and there was lots of activity undertaken kind of between 2008 and maybe 2013, 14. We've seen the expansion of early learning and childcare certainly more recently, but we still are talking um, and, and then maybe not quite uh, taking the right steps yet, as I think Peter was uh, 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 was saying just, just before this session. OK, thank you. Eva. Thank you, Janet. Yes, I was going to say, well, first of all, to acknowledge how important this evidence is, because it is the Dunedin study shows how important early years educators are to young children and what they can achieve complementing the work of parents, because it's different and they are socialised, they're helping children to become socialised within a group setting very often. OK, I'll leave child minders aside. But that really takes me right back to a point that I briefly touched on in my presentation is that in order for the practitioners and the educators to be the best they can be, we have to show we value them. Because that very sensitive support for children in the early years that helps them learn these valuable skills in the group and helps them to control themselves in a challenging situation, it depends on practitioners who stay for instance who are there who gain experience and stay not a fast turnover of practitioners practitioners of different ages with different types of experience and so on and we're not yet doing that mm -hmm. so i think our expectations of what we can achieve with the service will have to be muted until we address that squarely yeah i think that's a, that's a very good point i i, I think i think that the the value that we place on childcare and childcare and education for early years has to be increased because it, it, we need to move away from it just being, well, we need to put the children somewhere for a period of time. I think that's a very, very critical thing that uh, society needs to address because it is so important and the data is there, it proves it. Um, I, I'm going to take another, another question because um, th th there's a question come in about um, how do we establish a national program to implement what you're talking about, Peter? Um, and I think one of the one of the challenges there is there is this debate about whether what what time what 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 is the age that a child should go to school? Um, and I think um, we've heard several views of that today. We've had heard the views that it should be it's fine where it is, that it doesn't matter, that it's actually education from zero onwards. Uh, and, and another one that says actually formal formal education should be started earlier or should be started later. And it, it, it sort of ties into another question that's come in, which is about the, 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 the sort of schoolification of early years and the fact that are we also not, not also pushing secondary down into primary? So are we moving everything downwards? That is a, that is a, a question that's come in. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I... <clears throat> I think in the current situation, not just in this country, but across um, the world, actually, we're in a, a sort of regime of readification, where childhood and youth is a constant process of readying for the next stage until eventually you are, you are ejected into the flexible labour market where you have to remain ready, of course, to meet the changing demands of the marketplace. So I think schoolification is actually part of a, of a larger process of readification because, of course, universities will also complain that secondary education doesn't prepare children adequately for university and so on and, uh, and so forth. But I think also this opens up, I mean, uh, it's not only the age, but the relationships that need to exist between different educational sectors. And the schoolification is a way of talking about um, a disparity of power 
between primary education and early childhood. And of course, it goes up the whole system that you know, secondary uh, lords it over primary and higher education uh, uh, over secondary. What we need to struggle towards is to move to new types of relationship in which there is um, actually an ex the building up of more equal relationships and the exchange and development of, of new and shared ideas about pedagogy. Um, so it's not a case of one adopting the other, but actually coming together to in pedagogical meeting places to actually develop educational practice overall. Mm -hmm. OK, um, there's a question come in specifically for Johanna. Um, um, how are practitioners supported in Iceland and other Nordic nations? Please, could you repeat? How are practitioners supported in Iceland and other Nordic nations? So the practitioners in early years, the, the, the early years worker. Teachers. Well, the, the, uh, the preschools are, are in most cases run by the municipalities. So the, the, the practitioners get uh, support from, from specialists uh, at the municipality offices, usually. Okay. Is that what, what the question was about? Yeah. I, I, I think it was probably around um, what sort of um, uh, educational support, what sort of development support, continuous learning, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that could be uh, within the municipalities who run the preschools or within the, the universities uh, okay. in service education at the university, yeah. Okay, that, that's good. Um, and, and there's a question now in for John, um, and it says, um, in the light of what Alison Cumming has said, could you say a little bit more about um, the care environment. I mean, I'm sorry, my screen's just moved it down. Um, uh, the care economy and the link this to high quality. I suppose it's the quality issue that's coming back. Sure, I mean, and it picks up the point that, that Ava had mentioned in her, her, her response as well. It's a transformation that's required about value. You know, you have to value the workforce. You have to invest in the workforce if you're going to get that return. And th there is a broader interest then in, in different forms of an economy. You know, the well-being economy is, a, is an idea that's promoted just now that we, we shouldn't just be driven by gross domestic product, but there are other metrics we should use to measure how well our society is doing. And in terms of, you know, being the driver of changing that economy, the care economy idea is that basically that's a return of investment. You know, when we invested or we are investing significant sums of money just now in city deals to transform our urban regions. And that's in a very traditional economic model of investing in infrastructure uh, and the, the returns will follow from that. Care economy argues actually we need a different way of thinking, that if we invested in our early years, what we've been talking about today, what being and belonging is all about uh, then there is an economic return that follows from that. But but there is a danger in this argument too. And I think it's a danger that, you know, that, that we've touched upon several times. I 100% would argue that, you know, that investing in a care economy would lead to a more quality care product and a more quality education because we have better trained, we have more resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with that return. But we also have to navigate the risk of not seeing the need to justify early education and care in terms of economic return. It's the problem that the play sector fa that faces. It's it's the the rationale between behind the, the getting uh, involved in play funding that the the government has invested last summer and will invest this summer that we somehow are not mature enough to value play, to value care, to value flourishing in its own right. We have to demonstrate there's an economic return in order to justify that investment. So there is an economic return, but that should not be the primary argument for why we invest. The primary argument should be in terms of flourishing. Um, but there is an economic return that should be acknowledged. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think there's a lot of discussion going on about high quality childcare, and there's a question come in about how do we enable parents to to actually in uh, in in the cases where it needs to be improve their the way they engage with their children. And there's been a lot of discussion throughout the day actually on the fact that we we are 
we are wanting not just thinking about the child but also thinking about the, the the environment in which they live and how do we support that in terms of the early years anyone wish to comment about how we might be able to um, continue to develop that support for families and I know that was mentioned by Alison when she was speaking about what the government's plans are I mean it, it really does it, it's a real opportunity but it's also a real challenge I think to be able to to think about how to do that I, I suppose I suppose Eva is 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 are there examples from elsewhere where there have been uh, people who uh, countries that have embraced the supporting the family as well as the young child? Yes, and I think uh, Johanna is well placed to comment on that, which is extra support for families, fin primarily financial. But I'm also thinking of what the COVID pandemic and particularly the first lockdown showed us. You know, when we saw the playgrounds, everything closed. I mean, mm -hmm. community facilities for parents are so important and we're not good at them. You know, in, in locally, there are good places. But so when I was talking earlier in my talk about support for child rearing, support for bringing up children in their communities, I'm thinking absolutely, you know, not just money for within the family, but facilities. Uh, a child-friendly environment in the community. Mm. The Netherlands are not doing too badly on that, but there's always room for improvement. But really thinking much more of where to take a baby and all that, and facilities that parents can afford. And I just cannot get away from the one in three children now living in poverty. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge. I mean, the, I don't know if anyone noticed on the on uh, there was a, an article on the BBC website probably months ago now about the man who had walked every single street in Glasgow, and one of the things he said he saw was the number of signs saying "no ball games here." And how that had changed over time. So the ability for children to play, to play outside, to go places that they would, whether we, well, I would have definitely done when I was younger. Um, and it's a lot more limiting now. And I think, you know, the, the fear that we have about our children means we are, to a certain extent, overprotective. And I think that was definitely mentioned during the course of today. And how much freedom should should we give them to allow them to ex experience different things? John, you've got your hand up. Very specific point with that. The Play Scotland did a campaign to get rid of those no ball game signs. And as it, it just requires us to rethink, you know, what, what is the logic behind that? You know, what is the problem? Uh, the problem is the types of environments we've created. Uh, you, you, cars have become much more prominent, of course, in the last 20, 30 years. But the way that we've designed our urban spaces hasn't given due recognition of how people use their community spaces. Uh, and therefore, the no ball signs is, is dealing with the wrong problem. Um, you know, it's to prevent children uh, hitting car, hitting balls with cars and being endangered by playing in games in spaces that's deemed to be inappropriate for them. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is the way that we've designed our spaces. But again, that's that's part of that logic and that that um, shifting of mind and shifting of what childhood should be. If we if we valued play, if we acknowledge then of, of the need then for kind of active and lively communities, we wouldn't even conceive of putting a no ball sign up. It just wouldn't be part of our mindset. So. Yeah. Yeah. Peter? Uh, well, yes, I'd agree with the points that everybody's made, but I, I, I go back to two other uh, parts of supporting parents. One is the model of the multi-purpose community-based children's centre or family centre, which I think is a very strong model and is, is there uh, to provide parents and other carers with all sorts of supports from, from, from the off. Um, and I think the other thing which I think Ava also emphasised and I would emphasise very much is to pay much more attention to the needs of employed parents because we're moving to a society where the vast majority of parents are in the labour market. And that means thinking, for example, not only of workplace culture and practices, but also having really strong leave policies. For example, um, parents should be able to take time off work uh, without losing much money if their children are not well, as um, uh, as you would see in a country like Sweden, where parents get a large uh, 
get up to 120 days a year of paid leave if they have a child who is ill. Mm -hmm. So I think there are lots and lots of things that we could do. We were really serious about supporting uh, parents. And I suppose the other thought is, you know, we should really have a society where we don't see a single food bank uh, any longer, because that, after all, is one of the biggest disgraces of the day. Yeah. Yes, that and that, unfortunately, during COVID and as we're seeing now with the price rises that are going on is increasingly a challenge and is increasingly something you see every day. I, I, I think uh, I think it's something that we, we all should be very ashamed of. So can I just thank everyone uh, um, and and just uh, wrap up this session? I think it's it it was good to bring everyone back together again, and I think it was it was very important to uh, to sort of reflect on the day because today's been a day in which we have reflected on the importance of and the impact that early childhood has on life chances of our children and actually on all of us, whether it was us and our, the early years experience that we've had or those of the young that young people are experiencing today. The data is there. It's it's completely undisputed. The early years really, really matter. We've heard from a wide variety of experts about the challenges that we as a society face to ensure that each and every child is given the opportunity to full, fulfill their wonderful potential, to grow up to be happy, healthy, contributing citizens. But we've also heard what we might be able to do and what is being done to ensure that we continue to improve the early years experience of all young people across Scotland. The showcase has allowed us to see what's happening and to share information so that we could learn from each other. I just want to ask you, to remember the video you saw this morning as you logged onto the conference, to know what we're trying to achieve, those happy young faces playing in the outdoors, experiencing new things, developing new skills and learning in a loving and caring environment. Something that we want to ensure is there for every single child. Today's conference has definitely contributed information, data and expert views on this important topic but it can't be the end in itself. The early years are so important that we must identify and take forward actions to achieve our goal of allowing all children to reach their full potential. So I want to thank everyone. I want to thank particularly the plenary speakers who are still here, but also lots of other people. So uh, those who've made the conference uh, possible, our sponsors, Education Scotland, University of Dundee, Edinburgh College, and of course, the Scottish Government. To the Minister, Claire Hockey, for her passion and commitment to children and young people, and to all the people working in the background that's made today happen. Speakeasy for providing the platform for this digital event, which I have to say I was really in trepidation about, but I think has worked very well. Uh, members of the conference organising committee from the Royal Society's Education Committee who developed the programme and um, worked very hard to make sure that we had a good day today and to the RSE team themselves for all the work they have done to ensure its success. But most of all, to those who have contributed to our showcase, to all of our speakers and workshop leads who have enlightened us, guided our discussions and provided insights that can take forward, that we can now take forward. And to all of you who have contributed your questions, your ideas throughout the day and have moved the discussion along and hopefully have learned some new things, but have also had the inspiration that you might want to take back to the places that you work. I've definitely learned a lot and I've enjoyed the day and I hope that you have. And let's continue to work together to improve the early years experience for all of children in Scotland. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.